When you check in at a hotel, do you immediately read the card near the door of your room which explains what to do in case of fire? Do you walk along the corridor to make sure you know where the stairs are? Do you check that the emergency exits haven't been accidentally locked, just in case the alarm should sound? Probably not. Most of us don't even think about these things, and if we do, we assume it'll be a simple matter to find our way out in an emergency. After all, there are bound to be emergency lights showing us where to go. But what if you're in your hotel room at night and the alarm really does go off? You probably won't leave your room immediately. It'll take a little while for what's happening to sink in. But fairly quickly, you'll make ready to leave. But what if, as suddenly as it started, the alarm stops and all the lights go out? You'd probably think that it must have been a false alarm. But if it was, then why aren't the lights working? You'd then probably feel your way around the room to find the door. You open it but the corridor is in total darkness. There are no emergency lights. You can't see which way to go, and there is the distinct smell of smoke. Each year in Britain alone, over 800 people die in fires, and over 16,000 are injured. A billion pounds of direct property damage is caused, and the indirect costs amount to many more billions. This photograph was taken at Dusseldorf Airport just after the fire in 1996 in which 16 people died and 60 were injured. The footprints in the soot show how confused people can become when it's pitch black and they're trying to get out of an unfamiliar building in a hurry, people believing that they're going to die. Professor Ed Galeer is a fire safety expert. His work includes building computer models which predict how people will behave in a fire. We've developed a computer model called Exodus which predicts how people evacuate from building structures. Uh, here we see a, uh, an example of a simulation of people evacuating from a, a cinema complex. One of the important things to understand in how people behave is that they tend not to do what uh, you'd expect them to do. For example, uh, people won't tend to use emergency exits, they're more likely to use the exit that they're familiar with, i.e. the exit that they've actually entered the structure through. Um, it's important when you're designing a structure to take into account the fact that people will not behave in the way you would necessarily want them to behave. So given people's behaviour in a fire, it is imperative that the fire alarms, ventilation systems, emergency lighting, exit signs and other essential equipment and services work throughout the emergency. There are two types of cable used for supplying these circuits. One contains organic insulation and is known as fire-resistant cable. The other is made entirely from inorganic materials and is called mineral insulated cable. And there is a British standard, BS 6387, to test the performance of cables under fire conditions. Cables have to pass three tests. The first test simulates the heat of a fire. In this instance, fire-resistant cable is being tested. The second test simulates what would happen should water come into play, from a sprinkler system, for example. Again, fire-resistant cable is being used in this instance. Finally, the most severe test of all, resistance to mechanical shock. Not only do fire-resistant and mineral-insulated cables pass all three BS 6387 tests, they both achieve the highest categories, C, W and Z. But do the three separate BS 6387 tests simulate what happens in a real fire? Neil Townsend is a group commander with the London Fire Brigade. The fire process is a dynamic process that involves heat release, you're getting flames obviously, you're getting water after being applied either from the fire brigade through their hoses or through sprinklers maybe. And as the fire itself and the heat impinges on the structure, you'll start getting collapse of structure. Essentially, you're getting this whole dynamic process of heat, water, things falling down. So it's important that any fire safety system, such as emergency cables for lighting, fire alarms, etc., can maintain their integrity throughout the life of the fire 
and obviously it would assist if they can continue even after the fire in the process where the occupiers can get back in and reoccupy the premises. So in a real fire, cable will be subjected to a combination of extreme heat, mechanical shock and water, and not what is simulated by the three separate BS6387 tests. Not only are the three tests conducted separately, in order to attain the standard, a new piece of fire-resistant cable needs to be used for each test. This is allowed by BS6387. But when a combination of heat, mechanical shock and water are applied to the same length of fire-resistant cable, this is what happens. You're watching what actually happened in the test house as it happened. As you can see, the fire-resistant cable failed after only two mechanical blows and before any water was even applied. Just imagine what would have happened to this cable in a real fire. So what happens when a combination of heat, mechanical shock and water is applied simultaneously to mineral insulated cable? Again, this is what the camera recorded as it happened. As you can see, the mineral insulated cable survived. Thus, any emergency circuits powered by this cable would have operated throughout a fire and beyond, precisely what Group Commander Townsend is calling for. Because it is imperative that essential circuits operate in a fire and at the request of customers, BICC Construction Cables has developed its own standard. The tests more accurately represent what happens to cable in a real fire. A length of cable is struck directly with a steel bar at the centre of the burner, simulating building movement and falling debris as the cable is heated to 950 degrees centigrade for three hours. The same piece of cable is then sprayed with water for 15 minutes to simulate sprinklers, a fireman's hose or a burst pipe for example. It is then bent at the point of impact through 180 degrees and subjected to further mechanical shock to simulate what might happen as the building starts to collapse. Finally, the cable is immersed in water for one hour whilst energised at its rated voltage to ensure it will continue to operate even after the fire has been extinguished to aid clean-up operations. Only mineral insulated cable passes these tests fire-resistant cable falls at the first hurdle, as you have seen. Again, just think, what would happen to fire-resistant cable in a real fire? As a result of the terrible fire at King's Cross Underground Station in 1987, in which 31 people died, London Underground specified their own standard for cables which must remain operational throughout a fire not just in their underground tunnels, but in their buildings above and below ground. Fire-resistant cable fails to meet this standard. The only cable to pass these tests is mineral insulated cable, which is the only fire survival cable. The superior performance of mineral insulated cable can be further illustrated in two simple demonstrations. 
Here, a length of this cable powering a light bulb is hit with a hammer. Because of its inorganic construction, the cable survives many severe blows without failing. But this is what happens when a length of fire-resistant cable is hit with the hammer. After just one gentle blow, the cable fails. Although there is no visible damage, this cable would no longer perform in a fire. This cable would no longer perform in a fire. This cable would no longer perform in a fire. To give the necessary mechanical protection, fire-resistant cable is sometimes installed inside a conduit. This not only increases the cost of installation, but brings with it a range of additional hazards. In this demonstration, the top cable is fire-resistant, fitted in a metal conduit. The bottom cable is mineral insulated. The fire creates toxic flammable gases inside the conduit, which are transmitted to other rooms, contributing to the spread of fire. Again, imagine the effect of that in a real fire inside a building. Once again, the mineral insulated fire survival cable is unaffected. Essential circuitry is vitally important for protecting the people who use all buildings, but our skylines are changing in unprecedented ways. There are a number of complex and unusual buildings uh, being built not only in London, in England, but around the world. And part of the problem for fire brigades and developers and architects is that there's no fire codes that we can just pick out the drawer and see how these buildings should be uh, fitted out with fire safety systems. Until we have a major disaster and we see how the buildings and the structure performs within a fire, then we'll never know how satisfactory uh, these buildings are. I think it's important that any safety system built into the building maintains its integrity and is tested to the highest standard. With responsibility for any aspect of safety in a building comes responsibility for the people who use that building. It is literally a matter of life and death that the cables which power the exit signs, the emergency lighting, the ventilation systems and the other essential circuits continue to operate during a fire and beyond. If you compromise on the cables used for essential circuits, people could die as a result.